was my orientation at St. Joseph's Hospital, and I just started volunteering as part of a Pet with Purpose team, me and Bailey, and we had just the most wonderful day. We did about a three-hour shift, and if you are sad or lonely, the best thing you can do is volunteer. Help somebody less fortunate than yourself, because believe me, there always is somebody, and when you give, you get back immeasurably. So I'm assuming we have sound, right, Kenny? Anybody uh, coming by? What does this mean? Two, two people. Well, two people. Seven. <clears throat> Ooh, boy, seven people. I know it's going to grow. So I'm assuming you guys can hear me because if you didn't hear me, you probably would have said something, right? So here we go. Just want you to know that Weight Loss Wednesday is filmed before a live studio audience. <laughs> All righty. So here we go. So welcome to Weight Loss Wednesday, where I answer your questions about healthy, sustainable, and permanent weight loss. Kenny has some questions that came in, but a few really good ones came in just in the last few hours on my phone, so I'm just gonna do these very quickly before Kenny reads me some more. So Diane said, for people without a gluten intolerance, does oatmeal fit into my program, and what about plant milk? So I'll answer the second half of the question first. Plant milk should be a condiment. You shouldn't be drinking gallons and cups. It's, it's something that maybe you put a splash on your oatmeal, but we shouldn't be drinking plant milk. Now that said, any plant milk is better than dairy milk, that's for sure. And when I became vegan in 1977, we didn't even have powdered soy milk. Now you can go to the 99 cent store anywhere in the world and get hemp milk, oat milk, hazelnut milk, rice milk, soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, quinoa milk, you, you name it. And they're very easy to make yourself very affordably. So I recommend making it yourself. I have recipes all over the place. Hemp milk, almond milk made from almond butter or hemp seeds, very easy to make, very cheap. Much healthier because there's no carrageenan or salt or oil or sugar, which is often found in these milks. I recommend that you use the milk with the least amount of added ingredients. So soy milk, believe it or not, is probably the healthiest if you're using boxed milk because it's just soybeans and water, but it's also the highest in calories and fat because soybeans are over 56% fat. That said, if you are using it just as a condiment, which is what we suggest, then it's probably okay. I personally am allergic to soy. I just usually make my own hemp milk from a couple tablespoons of hemp seeds or my own almond milk from a couple tablespoons of almond butter. Soy milk is the only one that I've seen that doesn't have oil, sugar, or salt added. You can get a lot of plant milks without the oil and sugar, but they're always gonna have salt. So it really doesn't matter in the scheme of things if you're using it as a condiment, but again, I would always recommend SOS free as the best way to be. So the first part of your question is, where does oatmeal fit in if you're not gluten-free? Well, here's the thing, oats actually don't have gluten. So the grains that contain gluten are barley, rye, wheat, spelt, and I believe trichotale has them. And oats have to be gluten-free for somebody that is truly sensitive or has celiacs because they're often sourced in a place where gluten is grown or in a, a factory where gluten is produced. But you can certainly buy gluten-free oats. That said, if you're following the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I don't recommend gluten at all. And so I refer you to two of the teleclasses I did, which you can find on Healthy Tastes online, one with Dr. Alan Goldhammer and one with Dr. Erwin Linsner. Dr. Goldhammer talks about in his 30 years of experience how gluten is strongly now linked to thyroiditis, hypothyroidism, specifically Hashimoto's, and he's seen people get well when gluten has been removed. But more so, since we deal with food addiction in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, gluten, even whole glutinous grains like, say, barley or, or, or wheat berries or couscous, in our brains they turn to gluteomorphine, and these are things that perpetuate eating, overeating, and so all the food addiction experts I've talked to, like Dr. Joan Iflin, recommends if you suffer from this condition, no gluten. And the thing is, is you don't need it. There's so many delicious grains without gluten. There's there's uh, rice, all kinds of rice, and wild rice, and quinoa, and teff, and millet, and amaranth. So, you know, corn is technically a grain. So you really don't need it when there's all these other delicious grains out there. And if you're a food addict or suffer from hypothyroidism, I would recommend not using it all. So thank you, Diane, for your questions. And so Kenny, uh, Nancy from the Ultimate Weight Loss Program posted a question that I just saw. And I wish we had a search engine box like Dr. Greger has on Nutrition Facts because I, I get this question a lot and I, I think I've answered it. I've answered it on my teleclasses and I know I've answered it on the Ultimate Weight Loss page, but she said, how late can you eat dinner? What's the latest? Well, 
the, the question would be, how late do you go to bed? Every doctor I have ever interviewed, and I've interviewed quite a few, and not all of them are plant-based, said that you need about five hours between that last swallow of food and laying down. You need that for health. You know, we have this little flap on our esophagus, and a lot of people have things like gastric reflux, GERD is very common, and you need about five hours. So how late you eat depends on how late you go to bed. You know, you should be going to bed like I think by 10 o'clock most people should you know our ancestors went to bed when it was dark they got up when it was light they weren't eating those 12 hours when they were in the cave so the thing is is there's an old saying breakfast like a king lunch like a prince dinner like a pauper you shouldn't be eating the majority of your calories a marathon at night any calories you eat it's they're going to be stored as fat and they're going to affect your sleep they're going to affect your ability to digest food it's just not favorable you need to design your life in such a way where that you can get breaks throughout the day which by law I think for most jobs are required or eat more during the day or eat more starch during the day so that dinner can be very light you know um, I believe it's the Adventist they call it supper because they're eating it's very very light like maybe you know a little bowl of soup or something so Find a way that you're not eating into the night. That's best for your health. It's certainly best for weight loss. If you're struggling with weight loss right now, I bet you're eating at night. And that's when all the emotional eating does. Almost all eating done at night is emotional eating. It's not for hunger. It's not for survival. It's for boredom or loneliness or anger or stress. So deal with that. Get your calories in earlier. Get your exercise and meditation in earlier so that you don't need to eat at night. And by the way, go to bed hungry one night. You're not going to die. You're not going to starve. We have thin people at True North that fast for 40 days that do just fine. And you know what happens if you go to bed hungry? You wake up hungry. And then you can reboot the cycle so that you're not eating so much so late. So Kenny, there's one other thing I want to address, and I apologize it's not on your list, because last week we had a question about breakfast from Tracy who said that after she eats her vegetables uh, she's eating oatmeal fruit and fruit she's getting bored is there anything else to eat and we had talked about how if you're looking for food for your excitement you're going to be bored and to look for your life to create excitement not your food but I had emailed her asking her what does she mean by that these foods aren't breakfasty and unfortunately she didn't get back to me until after last week's broadcast and she told me what she meant and I also asked her what was she eating before that she doesn't like these foods that we're recommending like sweet potatoes and things like that and she said well before coming to ultimate weight loss she was paleo so she was eating things like bacon and eggs and before that she was eating refined carbohydrates so what I want to say to you, if something doesn't feel like breakfast to you, it's because that's how you were raised. So we develop taste preferences for what we habitually eat. And a child's palate is developed by their environment and also by marketing largely. You know, if you see commercials on Saturday, well, when I was little, we only had cartoons on Saturday and we were bombarded with commercials for, you know, Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries and Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, those kind of things. But a child's palate is not fixed. It's created by the environment in which we grew up. And so when you look to cultures around the world, they're not eating bacon and eggs for breakfast. They're not eating Captain Crunch for breakfast. They're not having coffee, which is a central nervous system stimulant. It's addictive with two other addictive substances in it like dairy and sugar. There was a great piece done by New York Times Magazine a while back where they talked about what kids around the world eat. And the, the article was eye-opening because six-year-olds in the Philippines eat, I can't remember the name, it's a four-letter word, but what they eat in the Philippines for breakfast is like a garlic fried rice topped with dried salted fish. Now, I don't know anybody in America that would eat that kid or not, but they think it's delicious because that's what they grew up eating. So if something is not breakfasty for you, there's no such thing as breakfast. I mean, as far as food, you eat food. Cultures around the world eat food for breakfast. They'll eat leftovers. They'll eat soup from the night before. Like I said, when I was in Japan in 1992 doing a television show, the, the hotel in Tokyo served everybody, whether they were vegan or not. Miso soup, rice, and salad for breakfast. So if something isn't breakfasty for you, it's just because you're not used to eating it. But there's no such thing as breakfast. And again, we develop taste preferences for what we habitually eat. When you start eating food habitually that's healthy, you will develop a preference for that. The only inherent taste preference for a human being is breast milk. Everything else is learned. And as far as breakfast is concerned, I don't think you have to eat breakfast unless you're hungry. No one could have become overweight or obese unless they ate outside the demands of true hunger. So eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full. As far as breakfast being the most important meal of the day, there's a word bre breakfast means break fast. 
I refer you to the teleclass I did with Dr. Jennifer Murano, who talks about the skewed research done by the cereal industry, claiming that what they were doing is they were comparing children from poor homes that didn't eat breakfast, but they didn't even eat dinner to ones that had box cereal for breakfast and said they perform better. So yes, it's important to eat when you're hungry and it doesn't matter what you eat. And the truth is, is if you're hungry, you will eat healthy whole natural food. If you require something specific like bacon and eggs to feel like breakfast or oatmeal with lots of sweet fruit, well, that to me is not hunger. That's, those are cravings. That's a hallmark of addiction. When you're hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're hungry. So that's what I have to say about that. And Kenny, what have you got for me today? Let's talk to the first question about Carol. Number okay. one, Carol says that there is a doctor that really that she really respects who says we should not eat white potatoes because of their high uh, glycogen um, glycemic, glycemic index. index, low nutrient content, and that they increase inflammation. Inflammation. Uh, <laughs> she wants to know what your thoughts are on this. <laughs> well, thanks you for the question, Carol. There's a doctor that I really respect named Dr. John McDougall that would probably disagree with that statement. So let me break it down into a few parts. Well, first of all, a lot of people tell you what you should eat, a lot of health professionals with letters after their names. But my question is, is how many patients have they treated? Because a lot of people look at things in theory, but not in reality. And that's the number one question I would get because a lot of times I speak at conferences and I, I'll go right after, I'll be talking about how if you want to lose weight, a great way to do it is to lower the fat in your diet and I'll have a speaker before me that says, oh no, we have to have fat, we have to have nuts. And so I wrote Dr. McDougall, I said, how do I deal with that? He said, well, have him write me. He said, and how many patients has that person ever seen? Well, Dr. McDougall's been in practice for 40 years and has seen probably thousands and Dr. Goldhammer, who I also respect, probably tens of thousands between the two of them in the last 30 and 40 years. So the question is, is if they're basing it just on research, you know, is this research done with people like me that are healthy vegans? Or are these done with the general American public? See, it's not that I don't respect or appreciate research, but you know, I have to wonder that when, when somebody says that, unless they have that in their clinical practice where they've seen time and time again bad things happening from white potatoes. Now that said, you don't have to eat white potatoes if you don't like them. And when you say white potatoes, are you talking about russet or does that include the rose red? Does that include the Yukon gold? Or is that anything that's not a sweet potato? doesn't matter because if you don't want to eat potatoes, you don't have to be, eat potatoes. As I said last week, there is no one food or food group you have to eat. A lot of the people in the plant-based movement make it sound like if we don't eat beans and nuts every day, we're going to drop dead. And I just heard Dr. Alan Goldhammer give a new lecture at the Portland Veg Fest on Sunday called What to Eat. And he said, if you can't eat beans, some people have intolerances to the whole legume family or allergies don't eat beans. Some people can't eat grains. He goes, don't eat grains. You just need to eat fruits and vegetables and some kind of starch and have enough calories. Now, you can't live on legumes or grains because they lack vitamin A and C, but you could live on potatoes. A couple weeks ago, I interviewed Andrew Spudfit Taylor, who is living on nothing but potatoes for a year, and he's getting all his markers checked, his blood, and he is extremely healthy. They have actually done experiments in the medical literature, and I encourage you to go to the websites like Journal of American Medical Association, Medscape, PubMed, and look these up. There's one that I read called the CON, K-O-N Potato Study, where this couple ate nothing but potatoes for an entire year. And they not only weren't bored, they lost no weight, they had no nutritional deficiencies. They actually needed to add oil because they were exercisers and they, they needed more calories. But they've done this a lot and there have been times throughout human history where that's all people got to eat and they were absolutely fine. That said, if you don't want to eat them, don't eat it. Eat sweet potatoes. You know, if I could only live on one food, it would be potatoes or sweet potatoes because I think they're the most satiating. According to Dr. Susanna Holt, the SI, the satiety index, there is no more satiating food than the boiled white potato. But if you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. Now, as far as the glycemic index, we don't eat foods solely based on their glycemic index. I mean, how many people actually just take a white potato and eat it with nothing on it? What's more important is the glycemic load of the whole meal. So when we eat white potatoes for dinner, we're stuffing them with some corn, with some beans, with some guacamole, either made out of avocado or peas, with salsa, with jalapenos, you know, maybe with vegetables. So the glycemic index of, of the potato is changed based on the glycemic load of the whole meal. So uh, as far as causing inflammation, that I can't address, but I think potatoes are pretty much the most perfect food in the world. I think that it's very sad if you don't eat them, uh, if you like them. Now I know that somebody maybe that's a diabetic would probably be better off eating sweet potatoes, but you gotta eat some starch and 
boy, for me, that's how I lost all my weight. I'm completely satisfied eating potatoes and I can't imagine a life without that. So I would take your question and I would ask it to Dr. McDougall. He does a free webinar with Dr. Gustavo Tolosa every Thursday at 11 o'clock Pacific time. It's a great question and let's see how he answers it. So thanks, Carol. Well, oh, you've got, before we go to the second question, everybody is talking about your, your blouse. Oh, and how I, much they love it. Thank you. I got it at uh, Macy's, $12 from the sales rack. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Very cool. Well, the next question is, comes from Colleen. Colleen would like to ask about keeping a food journal. What's your mm. thoughts on food journaling? Just do it. And it doesn't have to be a fancy app. If you're an app person, that's fine. But I think committing pen to paper is the best. Get yourself a journal for the 99 cent store. Research was done in 2008, and the, the name of the journal, the American Journal, I can get it for you, but it's escaping me right now, was done. And they discovered that people that kept a food journal lost twice as much weight as people that didn't. Something magical happens when you write it down, because then you're accountable. I recommend not just keeping a food journal, but have it be a little bit more comprehensive and be sort of like a food and mood journal. Especially if you're a person that's a stress eater, an emotional eater, a food addict, this can be very helpful. There's often clues in that journal. Now, before I tell you how I would recommend you keep it, I think you also asked how long should one keep it for? Well, I think until you get the results you want. So if your result is weight loss, I would keep the food journal at least until you're at the weight you like and then for at least two years later because it's very rare for anyone to maintain a weight loss over two years. The research says that 98% of the people gain it back within two years. It's about 66% in the first year, 22% in the second year. So I would keep it for at least until you lose weight and then a couple years later. It becomes a habit and it's a good habit. Let me tell you why I think it's so important to keep a food journal. And I'll use an example that has nothing to do with food, but it happened the summer of my between my sophomore year and freshman year at college at the University of Pennsylvania. That would have been, I believe, 1978. So I stayed on campus that year in Philadelphia, I, even though I lived in Los Angeles. And I was on scholarship and I was working, but I had no money. I was like broke. And I had a brother 10 years older than me. Well, I still do. And he was kind enough to help me financially. And I kept writing him or calling him and saying, please send me more money. And eventually he said, no, not until you give me a budget. And I'm like, I'm 18, what do you mean give you a budget? He said, for the next month, I want you to write down every single nickel that you spent. And doing that was eye-opening because you don't realize where your money's going if you don't keep a budget like that because, I mean, you know, a, a nickel here and there and a cup of coffee actually probably was a nickel back there, but that adds up. I was playing a game of pinball called Jungle Queen that I was addicted to. Boy, those quarters go fast. But after doing that, I knew exactly where my money went and why I didn't have any. And I was able to make changes. Things like eating out. I didn't like the dorm food, so I'd eat out. Well, I could have made those meals at home for a lot cheaper. So doing that made me realize the importance of, of being accountable. And it's the same thing with the food. Most people, whether they have a coach like me or not, or the support system of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program where they're sharing their results, if they're being honest, if they have to write it down, they're probably not going to write want to write down that they went to McDonald's and had a Big Mac, you know, large fries and a chocolate shake. So right there, it really helps when you're accountable, sort of like Bobby Anderson, the plant fuel trucker does on his Facebook page. He's the big rig trucker that in his truck for like 20 hours a day and is cooking his meals in an instant pot. He did that to make himself accountable. So it, it makes you accountable. And if you're not getting the results you want, you can find clues as to why if you're if you're doing this honestly. Because it's whenever people struggle on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I say send me your th three day food diary. Almost nobody does it because nobody's keeping a journal, even though that's one of the things we recommend from the get go. I would say instead of just saying what you eat, and I don't care how much you eat, you know, I just want to know what. I would put down the time because there can be clues to the time, which I'll explain to you in a minute. I would put down how you felt before you ate and after you ate, so a food mood journal. And I would even consider putting down how hungry you were before you ate and how satisfied you were after you ate. You know, I had this client that was eating like a bag of chips, a large bag of chips every day. And it's like I was in the food journal. I'm like, well, of course you're not losing weight. And then when I had her commit more to as far as how she felt and what time it was, well, we figured out that she was eating this bag of chips every single day at five o'clock when she was commuting home on the horrible freeways in Los Angeles because she hated driving in traffic. It was very stressful, so she was eating chips. You know, they say that our cravings 
can dictate what our mood is. And the people that tend to crave crunchy things, they're either very angry or they're very stressed. They go, nah, 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 nah. And so, of course, she hated being in traffic, and she, that was why. It wasn't until she told me what, what was going on and what time of day it was that we figured out. So now we have her listening to uplifting things, listening to myself and John Pierre on CD in the car. We have her reaching for some jicama fries because she wants that crunch. That's not going to hurt her. 100 calories a pound instead of 2,500 calories a pound. So I think it helps to do that as well. And the other thing that's great about keeping a food journal, even though this probably wasn't where you were going, is if you have any food allergies or intolerances, this is how you're going to figure them out. Last week we had a question about bloating. And I was very sick with some GI issues in 2014. And for eight and a half months, I kept an amazing food journal because I had been to 14 doctors and three, two of them were immunologists and one was a naturopath and they all did allergy testing. They either did the skin or the blood and none of it was conclusive. And if I had listened to all three doctors, there would have been about 50 foods that I wouldn't be able to eat now. But the doctor that I think was the best of the, those said that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so I did an elimination diet of all elimination diets, and you can find a great one on drmcdougall.com. And for about eight and a half months, I ate nothing but sweet potatoes and zucchini. Well, I wasn't bored because there's so many ways to cook zucchini and so many different varieties of sweet potatoes. I didn't lose any weight at that time because you can get enough calories and you can live on potatoes and a vegetable. But what, what it enabled me to do is whatever was going on with my GI tract, pretty much heal it. But then what I started to do was do my own investigation. And by keeping this food journal, eat one food and then wait you know, a week or several days. And that really helped me. And so that's another reason to journal. But I really recommend you do it. And it, it, it really is valuable. You will lose twice as much weight as you do it. But a lot of people don't want to do it because they still want to be binging or eating crap. And they don't want anybody to see it. But great question keep a food journal 99 cent store that's mine I should have brought it out and show you uh, but you know people that are really successful like Shada if I were to ask Shada what she ate on you know January 4th 2014 she'd be able to tell me a lot of people can't even remember what they had for breakfast but keeping a food journal really helps that's great I keep a journal for um, or tracking my numbers for my business and my coach always says the same thing track your numbers how do you look back to what you did if you don't know what exactly. you did? Exactly. It's all written down. Great point. And Kenny Robert Cheek, who you know is fitness oriented, says the same thing with, with your reps and your workout. It's also a wonderful tool. Okay, our next question is from Kathy. Kathy would like some tips on hosting a holiday event for people that eat differently. Well, here we go. She's my gone. advice is don't do it. And if they ask you, just say. <laughs> So I'm being kind of funny and kind of not. I, if you haven't seen my holiday webinar, or it's not my holiday webinar, it's the seven strategies for surviving the holiday webinar that I did last Wednesday with Dr. Gustavo Tolosa, I'd recommend you watch that first of all. And if you need more support on surviving the holidays, we have a webinar series that starts next Wednesday with lots of the wonderful doctors that know a lot about this, like Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle, we have Dr. Ifland, and some lay people that I have done this successfully if you need more support. So if you're hosting an event for somebody that's, or many people that aren't eating this way, and you absolutely have to do it and you're committed to going through with it, my advice would be to just make the most delicious food you can that is in accordance with your beliefs and the way you eat. I don't smoke cigarettes. You can smoke if you want, but you're not smoking in my house. Just like I don't drink alcohol, you're not drinking in my house. So I don't understand if you're really committed to a certain lifestyle, whether it's for health reasons or ethical or moral reasons. You know, if you kept kosher for a so I believe that all your home, especially if you're overweight and a food addict and want to recover from those conditions, is if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And that food should not be in your house. And that's just my feeling. Let's say you disagree with me and you've committed and there's going to be, well then what I would do is it's a potluck so that you make the healthiest meal possible that aligns with your way of eating. And if somebody else wants to add some crap or dead decaying animal flesh or something like that or poison like alcohol, then they have to buy it and they have to bring it, but it has to leave that night with them or go in your trash or preferably in your garbage disposal because I can't tell you how many food addicts will pull food out of the trash and eat it just like that famous episode of Seinfeld. So the thing is, is you know, if you make some, we, we have a holiday webinar coming up uh, where both Dr. Tolosa and I cook, the food is delicious. We tested it on regular people that weren't vegan, that weren't SOS free. If you can make delicious, amazing food, 
Why not? And the thing is, is the holidays have to be about more than just food because you can just stuff yourself silly any time of the year. Why not make it about something meaningful? Why not just go volunteer at a shelter like I do? You know, why does it always have to be these, 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 um, you know, it, it just, uh, what, what's the word I'm thinking? You know, just obscene um, orgies of food. You know, let's get back to the true meaning of the holidays and, 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 and have it be meaningful in other ways. But if you have to do it, you got to do it. But I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't cave to anybody else. And, you know, when we were in Portland, Heather Goodwin, who's lost over 200 pounds on the program, was talking to Shada, one of the most successful UWL clients who's kept her 100 pounds off for four years now. And she said, I see why Shada's successful because she won't compromise. So, you know, uh, it's up to you, but my advice would be don't do it or just make it the way you make it and they'll either like it or lump it and then they can go to McDonald's on the way home. That's, but you're asking me, you know, I'm not a people pleaser. And by the way, the more people pleasing you are, the more likely you're gonna be overweight. That's not good. I know, Kenny, are uh, you a people pleaser? Sometimes, but I'm not gonna eat whatever they wanna eat unless it really feels good for me. And, uh, <laughs> good for you, Kenny. I can put on a couple pounds if I want to. Right. Well, he's looking good right now, ladies, and he's still single, believe it or not. Gosh. Well, Gary has a question. Okay. He is a sugar addict and yep. wants to know if it's okay to eat dates. I'd go on a date, but not with him. <laughs> but So... The more information you can give me when you ask these questions, the better. Because when you say okay, okay for what? So for example, if somebody was a brittle diabetic on insulin, the answer might be different than if somebody is a 20 year old triathlete. So it, it depends what your goals are. I always look at things as good, better, best. So when it comes to sugar, I don't consider dates sugar, not whole dates. They're a whole natural food. They contain water and fiber and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidant nutri antioxidants and micronutrients. They are about 70% sugar, but the research Dr. Greger shared with me is that they're still the most favorable of all the sweeteners, even for most diabetics, because they are a whole food with all the fiber and water intact. The thing is, is they're still quite calorically dense. I actually have some visuals to show you in a minute because people keep writing me saying that the visuals that I showed you for the last two weeks when I did food comparisons were helpful and I just had some food around the house that I pulled out to show you that with dates. But here's the thing. So dates are 1,300 calories a pound. They're less calorically dense than sugar, which is 1,800 calories a pound, but they're more than six times as calorically dense as the whole fruit, say like apples, which are 200 calories a pound. Now. For somebody that's a food addict, dates are generally not recommended, at least in all the food addiction programs that I have learned about through my clients. I've never actually been to any of them. That said, I don't eat dates anymore, but I did eat them when I transitioned from being a sugar addict to being a person that ate only whole foods. The Ultimate Weight Loss Program didn't exist in 2003 when I had my uh, pre-cancer uh, diagnosis. And so I knew I had to get off sugar and flour, so I started eating things like dried fruit and nuts, which are certainly a better choice, but almost as calorically dense. Actually, you know, when you think about it, nuts at 3,000 calories a pound are more calorically dense than flour, which is 1,500 calories a pound, but still, in my opinion, a way better choice, a whole food. And if you get my book on process, there's 40 delicious dessert recipes made with dates and nuts that if you're not overweight, if you're not a food addict, they're great for kids, they're great for people that can afford, you know, more calories than that. So you could argue that it's difficult if you're a sugar addict. You know I was one. If you read my book or heard my story at drmcdougall.com from fat vegan to skinny bitch, I started every day with a Coke Slurpee, drank regular Dr. Pepper, ate candies, cakes, cookies, pies, and ice cream all day. Would I have been able to go from that diet to the diet I eat today? I don't know because I didn't know about this diet. So I use dates as a transition much in the same way that people that are on the standard American diet use the fake meats like Gardein and whatever they're all called, uh, you know. Beyond. Yeah, beyond meat, to transition to a vegan diet. But here's the thing, some people never transition. I know some people that have been vegan for years and are still eating the highly processed crap and the day of cheese and not, still not eating fruits and vegetables. Now, I, I, I don't, uh, how can I say this? I just can't say to every single person out there, no, you shouldn't eat dates. But you need to be in tune with your body to know what foods work for your body. So. As you transition to a healthier diet and maybe a slimmer physique, 
foods that maybe work for you once maybe no longer will work for you. So we have a gal in the group that got down to her fighting weight, a size two, and she decided to reintroduce dried fruit and nuts, making those delicious little larabite-like truffles, and then within no time, <clears throat> she gained back 5% of her weight. Mm -hmm. It didn't work for her. Now, there's, I can't tell everybody they can't have it. If dates or nuts or anything is a trigger food for you, I would recommend you don't eat it. And how do you know if it's a trigger food? Well, I differentiate a trigger food from an addictive food in this way. Even though not everyone that drinks alcohol is an alcoholic, alcohol is still addictive. And even though not everybody that eats sugar and flour is a food addict or overweight, these are still addictive foods. So. That, that I would put in the category of addictive. Nuts and dried fruits, I don't think of these as addictive, but I do think of them as trigger foods for many people that struggle because they are so calorically dense, meaning they're producing more dopamine in the brain, they're so delicious, that they tend to perpetuate overeating and cause us to eat more food. Dates are intensely sweet, and compared to sugar, maybe not so much, but once you get off them, they're, they're really, really super sweet. So I don't eat them anymore. However, a few of the recipes I created, the savory recipes, call for a few dates. For example, yummy sauce has three dates in it. My sun-dried marinara has, I believe, three or four dates in it. I can eat these without being triggered, the savory recipes. I don't know of anything else to use other than dates unless you use nothing or maybe I haven't tried an apple or a beet because here's the thing, I recommend no sugar. Not honey, not agave, not maple syrup, not barley malt, not, uh, uh, what's the other one? Bar, uh, brown, rice. brown rice syrup. I certainly don't recommend the sugar alcohols. Even though they have zero calories, the erythritol, the xylitol, the mannitol, and the stevia, they're worse. They're worse for food addiction, they're worse for weight gain, and I've explained that many times in these broadcasts. And now we're discovering uh, through Dr. Esselstyn that these fake sugars, these zero calorie sugars, are still not good for the endothelial, and all the GI doctors that are talking about the microbiome are saying that erythritol is horrible, disrupts your microbiome, so don't eat those, please. So if it's a choice between eating dates or any of the other fake sugars, zero calorie sweeteners or sugar, I would say go with dates, it, you know, if fruit won't do it for you. But let me just explain from a caloric density standpoint, because you didn't tell me if you were, if you had trouble with certain foods or if you were trying to lose weight, I don't think you're in UWL, but let's look at some visuals. So this right here is zucchini. It's almost two pounds. Zucchini is 67 calories per pound. I haven't cooked this yet. This will probably be my breakfast tomorrow, steamed zucchini. So I can have this much zucchini. It'll be less calories than this many dates. What's going to fill me up more? That's a lot and, difference. And can you, can, you be, can you be satisfied with this many dates? Now remember, dates are going to vary from about 25 calories a date for a deck like Nora to up to 66 for a large medjool. So nothing I love better than artichokes and I can eat these two artichokes and they'll be less calories than this many dates. What's going to fill me up more? What's going to be more satisfying? Now, last week when I showed you the 12 jars, I showed you that this is 400 calories a date. So this is about eight of the Medjool or maybe 12 of the Deglet Noor. This is 400 calories worth of dates. It's, I don't think even a cup. This jar holds four cups. Your stomach holds 4.22. So for this many calories a dates, I can eat two pounds of butternut squash. And I make these into croutons, I can roast these, I can make soups. So again, you know, think about caloric density when you eat because when you really understand caloric density and apply it to your life, you can literally eat twice as much food yet take in half as many calories. And so for me, I just don't get enough bang for my buck with the dates and the nuts. They're gonna leave me hungry. So hope I answered your question, Gary, thank you. We have a question here on, on the line here from right. Dana, and she was saying Hello. that Dr. Goldhammer discussed vitamin B the other day yes, with B12 your probably. group uh -huh. and uh, using vitamin B. Do you recommend vitamin B? Do you take vitamin B well, spray, drops, um, or what well, do you do I, with I think, vitamin B? I think she means vitamin B12. And yes, as somebody that's been vegan for almost 40 years, I definitely take B12 every day. I take the methocobalamin. I buy the kind they sell at True North called Pure. I take the capsules. My husband takes the liquid. But from what I understand, there's an equal amount of deficiency of B12 through meat eaters and vegans. B12 is not something we can get from eating foods. The, we, we, the animals don't produce B12. They get it from eating the dirt and the soil. And since we have such hygienic practices now, as compared to our ancestors, we're not getting B12 naturally. Dr. Goldhammer spoke on Sunday saying that he didn't supplement with B12. I, th I believe 
it took him from the age of 16 when he became a SOS free vegan to about the age of 43 till he even started showing the most little bit of deficiency in his blood but it's better to err on the side of caution it's a cheap uh, a vitamin that you can uh, it's it, it's it's not gonna hurt you if you take too much I take it every day because otherwise I don't remember that I took it but I believe you need a thousand micrograms a week but I would definitely check the true north website okay it's 236 we're gonna get on to this last okay, question one more question last question from Mallory Mallory wants to know how does a person who is a food addict in recovery avoid becoming complacent <laughs> about this way of eating and not letting her, their guard down. Is it, is, is it simply a question of time and mileage? I keep up all my recovery activities and sometimes I'll catch a th I thought in my head and realize that the culture conditioning is creeping in again. Well, first we all of, drift a little yeah. bit, don't we? Well, first of all, Kenny, I'm going to recommend you get glasses because that was actually Hillary that submitted that question, not Mallory, but that's okay. That's a that's a cool name as well. That's a really great it just question. Just sounded better, Mallory. Than no, Hillary, no. So. Um, that, that, <clears throat> that's publicly known. Hillary's smoking hot. She, we we wear the same shirt. This we have this blue shirt that has like all kinds of cool like uh, jagged stuff in it. So. To get back to the question, it's a great question, especially for this time of year, because we have Halloween coming up in just a few days and more people relapse on that day than any other day of the year. And a lot of times that relapse leads to a 63 day binge that they don't recover from until January 2nd. By then they've gained 10 pounds, which is why we're doing this eight webinar series on surviving the holidays to help people like that not fall through the cracks this time of year again. And so, there's a saying in addiction programs that when you're getting sober, your addiction is in the corner doing push-ups, so it's gonna come back even stronger. So my feeling is, is you always have to do recovery activities if you wanna maintain the results you have in your slender body, which I know you have, very hot by the way, and your brain chemistry. I think about Philip Seymour Hoffman, and though I don't know him, per didn't know him personally, terrific Oscar-winning actor, loved him. And I, I, when I investigated a little bit about his death, from what I seem to learn, that was written about him is that he had struggled with a heroin addiction, and he had been sober for something like 23 years, and then one day he had some alcohol, and the next thing, the next few days, he had died of a fatal heroin overdose. I don't know what led up to it, but. If you're in recovery from one addiction, the idea is you don't want to then go to another one. So for instance, if you're a cocaine addict, you don't then just start drinking. Or if you're giving up alcohol, you don't go to pot. You know, it's all these addictive substances, all these drugs that we're supposed to be absent from. And if you're a food addict, it's the highly addictive processed foods like the sugar, the flour, and the alcohol. So the thing about the addiction being in the corner doing push-ups is so true. And when I think about Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think about a term that I've heard in addiction, I don't have the exact term, but what happens is, is if you have been abstinent, or if you've been sober, let's use him as an example. So imagine for 23 years, he has not had any of these highly addictive substances in his body, heroin or, or any drugs or alcohol. And then he goes now after 23 years and has a drink of alcohol. Well, my God, it's so much better than ever because when you use a substance every day, whether it's coffee or you know, in the morning or wine at night, or if you smoke cigarettes, when you're using every day, you're using these substances because you're addicted to them and it's not even so much to gain pleasure. It's just because you've habituated and you're using them just because if you stop using them, you'll feel bad. So the first time you have that puff on the cigarette, the first time you have that drink of coffee, the first time you have that sip of alcohol or that, you know, whatever it's called when you have pot or whatever, or cocaine, you get so much dopamine, more than ever could have happened in, to our ancestors in nature. It, all the bells and whistles go off and the lights like Las Vegas. And what that's how you get addicted so quickly to this. And then you like it, you wanna do it again, but then you have to do more and more to get less of an effect. Well, if you've been away for it for a while, and this is why I think it's so dangerous for people to relapse on Halloween if they've been abstinent, is you're finally neuroadapting to the pleasure of a whole food plant-based diet without sugar, oil, salt, and you're gaining some stabilization of the brain chemistry, your body is starting to uh, find its natural weight, and then you reintroduce this substance. Well, now it tastes way better than you ever remember. And so, of course, it's not gonna be, 
easier to stop, it's going to be harder and you're going to want to do it more and more, which is why I say to people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I actually say this to everybody, that in my opinion, as somebody that has been in recovery for almost five years now with one relapse and one year relapse, it is so much easier to stay compliant than it is to continually try to get compliant, to detoxify again and go through that pain of withdrawal. So you're doing everything right, Hillary. You just, it, it, this is a world, as Dr. Goldhammer says, that is designed to make us fat and sick. And if we cooperate and be like everyone else, that's what's gonna to happen to us as well. And that's why we need support, especially this time of year from our tribe, from the Ultimate Weight Loss Program or from this webinar series, if, whether you're in Ultimate Weight Loss or not, because it is very easy to get sucked back into the pleasure trap to do what everybody else is doing, because especially as women, we were taught to be good and not to, um, and to agree and you know not to be difficult not to be heard and this can be very very difficult especially this time of year especially if you're a people pleaser so I just want to add one thing Hillary so I after being overweight or obese for 52 years I've been slender now for almost five years and after I hit the two-year mark and got accepted into the National Weight Control Registry for people that have lost at least 30 pounds and kept it off, I had a chiropractic appointment with Dr. Goldhammer. And, and while we were talking, I said, so I'm okay now. He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, I'm safe now, right? I said, I've kept my weight off for two years, so I don't have to worry. And he goes, like hell you do. He goes, he goes you can't cure obesity. You can't cure food addiction. The best you can do is manage it for the rest of your life, every day. I said, your husband has an affair, your dog dies, and you're in that jar of peanut butter faster than you can snap a, a whip. So, you know, when he said that, I was like, oh my God, but you know what? He's right. You can't cure any lifestyle related diseases. All you can stop, all you can do is stop doing the things that created it. So if you're sober, if you're an alcoholic and you become sober, you don't maintain sobriety by going back occasionally and drinking little bits of alcohol here and there because it's at a party or because somebody poured the drink just for you. You have to continue these activities. I didn't understand about food addiction until about four years ago when I saw the movie Flight with Denzel Washington and realized even though I was on my way to becoming slender, I was still a food addict in my brain. And um, where was I going through that? Uh, with that thought, uh, I don't know. I was going to say something really profound here. Let me do uh, a quick wrap up. Well, yeah, wait, wait. Let me just give me one second to could just show Bailey taking a nice little rest. And let me think Studio this. audience is working hard. Um, I don't know what I was going to say, but I'll try to remember it last week. So, um, I'll try to remember it last week. I'll try to remember it for next week. But anyway, I, um, you have to keep these activities going all the time. So, so what I guess what I was going to say is like, you know, if you, if you got a great body from working out, like some of the vegan athletes, you, you don't just stop working out and expect the body to, to stay the way it was. And it's the same thing these things have to be managed on a daily basis. I think this time of year can be really stressful, so you may have to up your recovery activities, and recovery activities are things like engaging in regular vigorous exercise, especially first thing in the morning, meditation, mindfulness, crafts can be very helpful. I think volunteering can be really helpful. So I don't think you can ever let your guard down, Hillary, and I think as a matter of fact, you might even have to What's the opposite of letting your guard down? Pull your guard up this time of year, like a protective shield. Put that like shield on. Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, it can be a really, really slippery slope because once you go back there, it's sometimes hard to pull people back out. Well, let me do a quick recap. Sure. Potatoes are good, period. As long as you don't <laughs> add stuff that's not good on them. And, and eat them with other things. Exactly. Food journaling, perfect. It's the way to go. Third, hosting a party, AJ wouldn't. Fourth, uh, sugar addicts or dates. Dates are good, but use them in small quantities. Very good. And Hillary, you just got that answer. Be careful. So AJ, <laughs> you want to tell them where you're going to be this weekend. Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. And great recap, Kenny. See, with Kenny, we could have done this in five minutes instead of 30. So I'm going to be at the Orange County Veg Fest. I'm speaking Sunday at 2.30 and doing a food demo with John pierre at 3 o'clock. And then after that, November 11th through 13th, I'll be at the Remedy Food Project Conference in Atlanta, December 12th at Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group in Detroit, and then ending the year at True North Health, December 23rd to January 2nd. We still
still have a few rooms available. If you want to escape the holidays and be able to eat and lose weight, go there. If you have a question for Weight Loss Wednesdays, please go to my website, www.eatonprocess.com, and you can submit it there and also sign up for my mailing list and consider checking out the upcoming webinar. I really do believe you can have both the health and the body you deserve. I'm Chef AJ. Thank you so much for watching. See you at OC VegFest.